Amen, church. It is my pleasure to welcome everyone here today for our youth day, our final youth day of 2023. And I just want to say I'm so grateful for everyone that is here today and those watching online. We welcome you as well. Today we will be blessed by not one, not two, but three speakers. And it is my privilege to introduce them. Our first speaker is Sister Kamoya Brown. She's 18 years old and currently attending college where she is studying to become a professor. Something I admire about her is consistency and determination when she sets her mind to accomplish something. Since she gave her heart to Jesus, she hasn't looked back. Her faith has grown tremendously and she has been striving to continue on the journey for God, on the journey God has set before her. Please say a prayer in your heart for her as she presents the message God has given her today. On that note, we move on to our next speaker, which is Elisha Wilson. He is 13 years old and attends Central Charter School. Elisha is a great friend to have. He is funny and has the ability to adapt to situations easily. One thing I admire about him is that he is willing to be used by God even when he is uncomfortable. May God put the words in his mouth as he allows himself to be used by him. Last but not least, our third speaker of the hour is Mahalia Johnson. She's 15 years old and attends Poplar Beach High School. What I like about her is that she is sincere. She speaks what's on her mind and she is willing to step outside her comfort zone. I admire her willingness to sing to the glory of God. And I pray that she continues to sing until she is singing in God's kingdom. We say a prayer on her behalf as she presents the word of God. But before she comes, we'll have a song of meditation by Catherine. And that's the part that burns in my heart and keeps me hanging on. I ask you how many times will you pick me up when I keep on letting you down? And each time I fall short of your glory, how far will forgiveness abound? And you answer, my child, I love you. And as long as you're seeking my face, you walk in the power of my daily sufficient grace. You are so patient with me, Lord. As I walk with you, I'm learning what your grace really means. The price that I could never pay was paid at Calvary. So instead of trying to repay you, I'm learning to simply obey you by giving up my life to you for all that you've given to me i ask you how many times will you pick me up when i keep on letting you down and each time i fall short of your glory how far will forgiveness abound and you answer my child i love you and as long as you're seeking my face you walk in the power of my daily sufficient grace hallelujah 
Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy and happy Sabbath to those online. I pray that as I speak today, that you'll be blessed by God's holy word. Thank you to Aaron for the introduction and Catherine for that song. Actually, that song, I think, ties really well with my sermon because it shows that no matter what we do, God will always be there ready to catch us. Um, our theme all day has been letting God fight for you, but my focus will be on letting God fight for you when you are lost. Isaiah 41 verses 10 says, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, please be with us as we go into your words. Please give us the knowledge, understanding, and wisdom that we need to interpret the words as you see fit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Have you ever been lost? Yes, yes. Okay. Lost for words, lost in the crowd, lost in translation, lost with no vision or direction, <laughs> lost in your head, lost in identity, or just lost in the sea of life. Everyone has experienced some degree of being lost, which is a natural thing as we continue to live on. But to be lost spiritually, emotionally, or in your identity was never God's plan for his people. Genesis 1 verses 26 reads, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Our identity is found in our, in our creator, and maintaining our relationship with him, true faith and obedience keeps us from being lost. Many people are alive yet lost in sin unknowingly. They think they're in fellowship or relationship with God, but if you do not obey him or believe in him, you cannot be with him. Then there are those who feel the weight of, weight of their sin, pulling them into the pit of despair and in their hearts wage a terrible struggle. Many are unsure of what to do, where to turn, who to call to, or what should be their next step. They are lost. What is my purpose in life is the cry. Diana Brady was one such young lady. She grew up in Kansas City and attended Adventist school her entire life. She was raised as a Seventh-day Adventist by her loving Adventist parents. Her family life was good. Worship was very important to the family. Her grandparents lived next door, so she would visit them after school each day. She testified that they were incredible witnesses and examples of God love of God's love for her. From birth to graduating high school, she had been living the perfect Christian life. Until college, that is. She lived in the Varen Springs area and Andrews University was on her mind. So that is where she went. At first, she tried studying business, but quickly lost interest since ministry was something that was always on her mind. She just wasn't sure what she wanted to do. Eventually, she switched majors and started studying youth ministries. She had always been inspired by her grandfather to study ministry. And while she was in high school, she had a girl's dean who left a huge impression on her heart. She would go to morning vespers and experience that worship by herself without family, and that became something personal to her. She'd hear of mission stories with youths her own age or in college, and that began to affect her life in a different way. However, while in college, she went through something that caused her to question the path she'd chosen to pursue. She thought about whether she was truly good enough and if this path was for her. Her faith became under severe trial. 
The Bible says in Romans 10, verse 17, So then, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Was she strengthening her faith? Was she strengthening her faith in the face of her trial? Did she slack off studying the word of God? Why did doubts find an entrance in her life? When trials come over you, your Bible is your best friend. And as trials intensify, so should study in the word of God. During her freshman year of college, her parents went through a divorce. It had been a difficult time that made her wonder what all this really meant. So she started seeking other ways to process the pain. She had been at a birthday party off campus, off campus with some friends when she decided she was going to order an alcoholic beverage. She had been underage at the time and didn't expect them to serve her. Spoiler alert, they did. She, it was her first ever drink and she only drank a bit of it. It was blue, tropical, and gross. That choice was not inspired by God. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. And in all, way, in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Leaning on God, choosing God's will for our most difficult times, is a shield against the enemy's weapon. Playing with sin is like playing with a body in the highway. The Bible commands us to flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, and with them call upon the Lord out of a pure heart. 2 Timothy 2, verses 22. Months passed, and she went home for a break. After the break, she went back to school where she was called to the dean's office. They said that they had found a bear in her fridge in her dorm room. She told them that she had apple juice, but the dean says that it was in a styrofoam cup. So she assumed that the dean thought that the spoiled apple juice was alcohol. She told her she had never had a beer before, but the dean retorted with a question. Isn't it true that you had a drink off campus? Ah, so someone had said something to her and in return caused the dean to suspect that the apple juice was alcohol. The affair left with a three-day suspension. <clears throat> the Bible says, bad company corrupts good, good um, character. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33. One compromise, one choice of sin for the first time can lead to a life of defeat. She reasoned within herself that if the dean had handled the situation better and people had asked what was going on and listened to what she had to say, things would have been different. She wanted someone to say, hey, what's going on? Let's talk about this. She felt like a fraud and a failure. She asked herself, who am I to be in ministry and struggling with something? It wasn't over just a drink. It was the suspension, the accusation, and then the divorce of her parents. She felt like she was going nowhere. She questioned where was God in all this and if anyone really cared. In the midst of our pain, we should remember that God is greater than our pain. And where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. When trapped in our own web of sin, we're never the victim. The, nail, the nails in, God, in Christ's hands and feet should pull us to repentance and faith towards God. But she became the black sheep of the herd, and it was too much to handle. After being shunned by her, by her friends for a long time, she decided to leave school and go home. Then things took an interesting turn. A few months later, a cousin of hers invited her out to eat as a way to cheer her up. It was there that she met her soon-to-be boyfriend of almost 13 years. He was her waiter and very friendly. He asked her for her name, and this being the first time she had ever been placed in this situation, gave it to him. She thought nothing of it and didn't expect to meet him again. Except two days later, when she was in a different part of the city, she had run into him. 
Kansas is a big city, so she thought, wow, there must be something here. It's pretty amazing that we ran into each other again. Sometimes a coincidence is just that, a coincidence. And sometimes the devil is at play. He had told her that he was from Italy and lived with his, with his family. She was 20 at the time, and all this was new and exciting. He seemed like a wonderful guy, very gracious and kind. Quickly enough, she found out that he wasn't Italian. He was afraid to admit that he was Arabic. He was a Palestinian and a Muslim. She didn't know anything about Islam. The world today and a couple of years ago's access to the internet and information wasn't as easy as it is now. And honestly, with information just at the tip of our fingers, we aren't looking for things that we have no interest in or that doesn't directly affect us. Deep down, she knew this wasn't a good idea. She knows God warns us of being unequally yoked. She understood what it meant to be with someone outside her faith, yet she made herself believe that this newfound relationship was just friendship. Sometimes we delude ourselves into believing what we want to believe and not what is right in front of our faces. God is calling us into truth. Jesus prayed, Sanctify them through thy truth, through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Never build your life on a lie. She was at a place so low that a man's attention, attention was helpful. He had a wonderful family, 13 of them, and he was in love with her. She met his parents almost immediately. The very first time she came over, she was met by his, all his sisters with a beautiful tray of tea and cookies and cakes and questions. The family was incredibly warm and kind. The devil will not come to us in fiery, raging forces. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 14, and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. So be sober minded, watch, your adversary, the devil, prowls about as a roaring lion seeking whom to devour. 1 Peter 5, verse 8. She was going through a broken experience, and the hurt and pain that her parents were suffering made it hard for her to confine her own struggles to them. So she found a solace in his family. A family that does not, a family who did not observe the Sabbath or know the Lord of the Sabbath. It became very easy to make an excuse as to why she would not be attending church this week or the next week until her desire for worship faded. Shortly, they moved in together and she experienced sex before marriage, which took her self-worth quite a bit lower. Like wine or bad advice, sin will take us into its currents if we neglect the word of God. Proverbs 23 verse 32 says, and at last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like a eater. It did not take long for Dana to realize she was in the devil's trap. The first time he placed his hands on her, he pushed her into a corner. It was just a push and he was very sorry about it. And sometimes we rationalize things just like a person would sin. Oh, it's just a white lie, I'm not killing anybody. She was doing the same thing. She told herself that he was sorry. It was a one-time thing, a mistake. Half a year into the relationship, the, the abuse was still there and only got worse. 13 years passed, an AK-47 was pointed at her head, a broken nose, glass bowl broken over her head, and more I could not fit into this sermon. Her response was cover-up. What kept her from leaving? She thought if she could just get him to believe in Jesus, everything would change. But she herself was not walking with Jesus, so how could she make him be known? His fam sec the second reason was his family was very nice to her. At one instant, Donna had shown up to his mother's doorsteps, bloodied and crying. She would always remember being swept up into her arms and crying together. His sisters didn't approve of what was happening, 
and his mother even offered to pay her wedding if she chose to marry someone else. They had loved her and she had loved them, so that family bond she once lost was restored in them. Donna confesses that she never felt the need to convert to Islam, even though the family encouraged her. But one day, her boyfriend's niece called her to the mosque. A special speaker would be coming and talking about family. She went and listened to the presentation as the ladies translated for her. She watched as the ladies stood, shoulder to shoulder, bowing and praying together. She wanted to be like them. Before this, she had no desire to practice a faith that is proven you to be in opposition to the character of God, which is love. She knew that Christ was the way, the truth, and the life. She would often pray for them in another room when they were praying together. But this time, she saw the unity, the commitment, and the connectivity that they shared. They were laughing together and talking to each other side by side, shoulder to shoulder, and she had missed the unity that she had at church and at school. So in her, ex in her excitement, she called the family over and said that she'd take the Shahada. The Shahada is a, is a proclamation that you believe in Islam, that Muhammad is the prophet of Islam and God has no son. This is like a Muslim baptism. Her decision was not based on truth, but pure emotion. The very night after she repeated the Shahada in um, Arabic, signed a paper and was now officially a um, Muslim, she stepped out of the mosque and felt a spell had been taken over her. She remembers the first, first thought she had was, what have I done? And instantly, in that moment, she heard an audible voice. You denied the Son of God. And then she heard laughter. Crackling, horrible, demonic laughter. They were, from that moment, she would hear what she believed were devils taunting her, minute to minute, telling her to end her life. It was very hard to have any peace. She cried out to God and told him that she hadn't meant what she had done, and she was very sorry, but it didn't feel the same. She was as lost as a person could be. She prayed to God, but there was no sense of comfort or reassurance, and so the panicking and the anxiety setting more and more. But our sermon is entitled, Letting God Fight for You When You Are Lost. If you can't fight, then God can. She remembers her parents' prayer, and the story they read from the Bible, the word of God. And then a quote, Ellen G. White grips her heart. It says, even when you don't have any evidence that your prayers are being answered, don't give up. Have faith because God is working. The Bible says, the Lord is nigh unto them that are brokenhearted, and save it such as a constrict spirit. <laughs> there many are the applications of the righteous. Afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. She might not be righteous, but her grandfather, who was praying for her, had a relationship with God. Youths need connected Christian to pray for them. She resumed reading her Bible and inspired works in secret, but the feeling of emptiness still hovered over her soul. With her Bible and the inspired words in front of her, she called her grandfather in a haze. All at once, she blurted what she had done, how she had converted to Islam, how God wasn't there anymore, how he didn't love her anymore, and she didn't know what to do. For a moment, there was silence, and then he chuckled. She was confused. Grandpa, did you hear me, she asked. I heard you, he said. I don't know what to do. Then he said something amazing. God knows what to do. Amen. Then she recognized he wasn't afraid. While she was terrified, he had a faith in God that was so astonishing that she came to realize how far her faith had dimmed. Her grandfather's faith brought hope to her heart. She began to think for just a second, maybe, maybe it was going to be okay. You see, a saved person's faith should be able to bring hope to the lost and the love for Christ. 
Upon visiting her grandfather, there was a night where everything had just boiled over and she called the local pastor for help. She needed help, but she didn't know what to do. The pastor listened to her story and tried his best to help, but to no avail. In the end, her, she and her grandfather went out to get something to eat. When the voices came back and it, be, and it became unbearable, Grandpa, I can't do this. I can't do it anymore. I can't breathe. I can't think. And I don't know what to do, she said. So her grandfather reached over and took the hand that was not driving and raised his other hand in the air and prayed. God of Abraham, I am a child of Abraham. My granddaughter is a child of Abraham. She's being harassed by your enemy, whom you have already overcome. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray, I am asking you today that you free her from the chains and you send the devil away where he belongs. And in an instant, she felt a flood of the Holy Spirit return to her. After that, she never heard the voices again. She broke off the devilish relationship she had had for almost 13 years, denounced Islam, and went back to God. When you are lost, allow God to fight for you. Make room for him in, in faith, prior, godly fellowship, and obedience, even when you don't want to. In Isaiah 45, verses 2, the Lord says, I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break into the pieces... I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut asunder the bar of iron. There is hope for the prodigal son if he will return again to his father's home. Yeah. Psalms 40, 45, 145 verses 18 says, The Lord is near all who call on him. God is with us, ready to guide and fight for us. Seek his guidance and accept his love through obedience. Do you know where you are right now? Okay, do you know uh, one person, everyone else is lost? You know where you are right now? Okay, whether physically or spiritually, if you are not in the arms of God, enjoying his peace through a living relationship with him, then you are wandering on the enemy's territory. But God is calling. Come on, come on now, let us reason together. Come to me. You can come to him from wherever you are, for God is not confined to a building. He is not too chained to move. Acts 17 verses 24 and 25 declares, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of, of heaven and her, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. He made all people and desire. Verse 27 says, that they might seek the Lord, if perhaps they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Do not call unto the Lord with hesitation and doubt, doubtful thinking. Jesus said, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the world, amen, unto the end of the world, amen. Your environment is important to your peace. In Luke 4, verse 16, he said of Jesus, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Jesus didn't keep away from the house of God. When we hear, what we hear and see can easily influence your, our actions and thoughts. And so Colossians 13 verse 16 reads, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and administering and admonished in one, one another in psalms, in hymns, and in spiritual songs, singing with the grace in your hearts to God. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 14 says, what, Whether therefore ye drink or eat or whatsoever you do, do it all in the glory of God. God is always close by. If you are feeling lost, come to Jesus today. He is ready and waiting for you to acknowledge him. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Today's title is Letting God Fight for You When You're Down. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, 
Today, I want to bring before you a powerful message about the unyielding strength and faithfulness of our God. Life's journey is filled with highs and lows, and there are times when we feel when we when we find ourselves burdened, discouraged, and facing insurmountable challenges. In those moments, it is important to remember that we have a mighty God who stands ready to fight on our behalf, granting us victory and bringing us comfort. In times of trouble, we must anchor ourselves on the promises of God's word. Psalms 46 verse 1 declares, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. By acknowledging God as our refuge, we are surrendering the battle to him, allowing his wisdom and power to guide us through our difficulties. In Proverbs 3 verse 5 to 6, it says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and learn not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. This further reminds us to trust in the Lord with all our hearts and not lean on our own understanding. Instead, we should acknowledge him in all our ways, and he will direct us in our paths. We must learn to lean on God's sovereignty, knowing that his plans for us are perfect, even if they might not align with our own. In Psalms 28, verse 7, it says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him, and I am helped. Therefore, my, greatly, my heart greatly rejoiceth, and with my song will I praise him. In this verse, it is talking about David expressing his gratitude towards the Lord for answering his prayer. David's response is to trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust in God transfigured his fear into peace and his trouble into triumph. God's power and protection are seen clearly in David's praise. One remarkable biblical account that illustrates this principle is found in Exodus 14. The Israelites, having fled the oppression of Egypt, found themselves trapped between the Red Sea and the approaching Egyptian army. Fear gripped their hearts as they believed they were doomed to be captured or killed. But in the midst of their distress, Moses uttered these fateful words in Exodus 14, verse 14. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Often, the hardest thing for us to do is to surrender control and be still. Our natural inclination is to strive worry, and exhaust ourselves in futile attempts to overcome our struggles. But God calls us to have faith and and trust in, in his ability to fight for us. When we let go and submit to his will, amazing things occur. Just as Moses raised his staff and witnessed the Red Sea part and the Israelites walk on dry land, we too will experience God's mighty deliverance when we release our worries and fear into his capable hands. Paul's letter letter to the Ephesians emphasizes that we are not alone in our battle. In Ephesians 6, verse 10 to 20, it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we are not contending against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the world rulers of the of this present darkness, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness, wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take the whole arm of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the equipment of the gospel of peace. Besides all these, taking the shield of faith, with which you can quench all of the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication, To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me, that utterance may be given in me, 
the utterance may be given me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am in, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly, as I ought to speak. In these verses, he describes the spiritual armor of God that equips us for every challenge. By putting on the whole armor of God, we gain divine protection and strength to face any adversity. This armor includes the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Armed with this spiritual weaponry, we can confidently allow God to fight for us. It is essential to understand that when we surrender our battles to God, he not only fights on our behalf, but he also restores and strengthens us. In Isaiah 40, verse 31, we are reminded that those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with, the, with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. God's intervention not only brings victory, but also rejuvenates our soul, enabling us to soar above the, our circumstances with unwavering faith. Dear friends, when you find yourself burdened, discouraged, or overwhelmed by life's challenges, remember that we serve a God who fights for us. Just as he parted the Red Sea, provided for the Israelites in the wilderness, and conquered his death through his son, Jesus Christ, he is capable and willing to do miraculous things for us today. Letting God fight for us requires us to be still, trust in his sovereignty, and put on his armor each day. May we find comfort and strength in the knowledge that our God is a mighty warrior who tenderly cares for his children. So surrender your battles to him, hold fast to his promises, and anticipate the incredible restoration and victory that await you. Let God fight for you, for he is able and faithful. May the, may the peace and blessings of our Lord Jesus Christ abide with you always. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath once again, church. So as followers of Christ, we have this incredible assurance that we don't have to live in fear. You see, when we surrender our lives to Jesus and accept him as our savior, we become a part of his family. And as part of his family, we receive his love, his guidance, and his protection. In the Bible, one of the most comforting verses that speaks to this truth is found in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. It says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. This verse reminds us that fear doesn't come from God. Instead, he equips us with power, love, and a sound mind to face any challenge that comes our way. Living in Christ means that we have access to an unwavering source of strength. In Philippians 4, verse 13, I'm pretty sure we all know this verse by heart. Let's say it together. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. This verse reminds us that Christ, that, okay, sorry. This verse reminds us that with Christ, we have the ability to overcome any fear or obstacle that we encounter. His strength empowers us to face our fears head on and to live with confidence. Another beautiful aspect of living in Christ is the promise of his presence. In Joshua 1 verse 9, it says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. A prime example of this verse is Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel was a faithful servant of God who found himself in a difficult situation. He was thrown into a den of hungry lions because he continued to pray to God, even though it was forbidden. But guess what? God protected Daniel and the lions didn't harm him at all. It's a story of courage, faith, and God's miraculous power. 
Living in Christ doesn't mean that we won't face challenges or difficult situations. However, it means that we don't have to face them alone. We have a loving Heavenly Father who walks beside us, guiding us through every step of the way. He's our refuge and our strength, and he promises to never leave us nor forsake us. So brethren, let's hold on to the truth that living in Christ gives us power to overcome fear. Let's lean on his strength, trust in his promises, and live with boldness and courage. We can face anything that comes our way because we have a savior up above that guides us every step of the way and gives us the strength to overcome fear. And to close, I would like to say Psalm 23. It basically covers all the topics that we have listened to today. And I'd like if we'd say together, so Psalm 23 is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me lie I don't in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. If you believe the Lord is at your right hand, please stand with me and join with me in singing our closing hymn, How Great Thou Art. Before we sing the last stanza, Ellen White said, Truth is not truth until it's act upon. Yeah. And so we have listened to three sermons from our young people. It's the final youth day for 2023. God knows that we have come thus far by faith, leaning on his everlasting arms. I therefore proceed to make a call for our young people. You know that if they're rightly trained, then they can do exploits for the Lord. They are in the majority, and we as adults are in the minority. In fact, we are told that 75% of the Seventh-day Adventist church is comprised of young people, youthful age. My brothers and sisters, we are been studying this quarter about the unreached, and many of our young people in our cities, in our world, in our communities are unreached. They are unreached. Some may be in church as well. And therefore make this call to offer hope through Jesus Christ. There is hope in Jesus. And if you are here, young people, first calling young people, you want to rededicate your life or you want to give your life to Jesus. We invite you before our youth leader pray the closing prayer that you leave the comfort of where you're standing or where you're sitting and make your way to the altar. If you're online and you're worshiping with us, then you can scan the bar, the QR code that's on the screen right now. And you too can make your decision for Jesus Christ. So young people, we are calling on you right now to live and walk for Jesus. We sing the last stanza. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation. And you hear the voice of Jesus speaking to you. We are calling our youth who are here to make your way to the altar. Let us pray. 
when Christ shall come, with shouts of acclamation. So it's a rededication, and it is and also a call to give your heart to Jesus. What joy shall if you're comfortable where you are, heart, then that's fine. If you want to rededicate your life, I shall if you want to give Jesus your heart, in you're saying, Lord, I want to come up higher. If you're saying, Jesus, I want to recommit my life to you was given me my life God in the first place. Then I invite you to come. my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. Then sings my soul. Heavenly Father, as we come to you once more, Lord, we just want to make sure that we have said it over and over again how grateful we are for you, Lord, how great thou art, Lord. We thank you for your love and your mighty and your journeys. We, pr we take this time to place our youth before you, Lord. We want to pray over them, Lord. Lord, we have all been young, but maybe at this time it may be a little bit different, Lord. So we pray that you may give them strength to get through any journeys or anything that they may be going through, Lord. Maybe they have not come to us, and we pray that we can be softer to them so that they may come to us, Lord. Please help us to be good role models to them, Lord. They may come upon many people and then many things in their lives, Lord, but help them to always know that they can look to you when things are rough, when they are feeling down, when they are feeling lost, when they are fearing, feeling fearful, Lord. Please watch over us as a church and help us to grow stronger with our youth, Lord. Help them to one day become the leaders that, we, that you would love them to be, Lord. We thank you for your love once more. Please watch over us and keep us safe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May the, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may, so that you may overflow the hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. silent meditation. Amen. Just a reminder, we do have lunch shared for everyone, and we are inviting everyone to come back for our Bible class, AY and Vespers. Thank you.